Well, good morning, and you may be seated. Welcome to worship today. I'm glad that you're with us. Thankful for our uh, membership. Thankful for any guests that we have today. I'm going to share some prayer requests in a moment, uh, some urgent prayer requests that we can keep before the Lord. But I want to start off uh, this morning by reading Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse 6. It's in your bulletin. It's also on the screen uh, behind me, or will be. But I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Focus our hearts on what we've just discussed uh, uh, through song, uh, praising God for the birth of Christ. That's what the angels announced uh, and, and sang about on the, more, on the day of his birth. And here's what Isaiah 9, 6 says, as it prophesied that moment. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's who he is. That's what he's going to accomplish. Some of that, some of that, what, uh, what he's promised to do will, will come about in time, not yet fully fulfilled, but we can be confident that it will be accomplished just as God's Word said it, it would be. Let's go ahead and bow a word for a word of prayer right now, asking God's blessing on the reading of his Word, and then I want to share some prayer requests with you before our choir sings. So, Father in heaven, I thank you for the truth of Isaiah 9. I thank you for the good news that um, the angels announced to the shepherds. And those shepherds heard that uh, heavenly choir sing. What an, what an experience that must have been uh, on that evening. And then as they went to Bethlehem, as they were instructed to do, and, and saw there uh, the birth uh, of their Messiah. And Father, we know that they left that place glorifying God and telling others of what they'd witnessed, and surely they didn't understand all of it, which is a great example for us to just share what we know, who we are, who we were, what Christ has done, and how he's accomplished that, and just to glorify God for his goodness, and for his gospel, and to proclaim that goodness and what we know of it to others. And as we read there, uh, in, in the New Testament, you know, people will take it to heart. People will be amazed uh, by the testimony uh, of Christ and the difference that he makes. So may we be busy about that work, Father. We thank you, Father, uh, for the truth of your word and the opportunity to come together uh, to sing it, to pray it, uh, and to proclaim it and respond to it. And we ask your blessing on our worship service this morning uh, and on uh, the special presentation from our choir this evening. Uh, Father, we ask your blessing on uh, both our times together today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, before the choir uh, scenes, I, I do just want to highlight some, uh, some kind of pressing prayer requests. <clears throat> One, uh, uh, Casey and uh, uh, Jamie Todd, whose baby Zoe was due in January, the start of January, January 5th, I think, that baby was born uh, December 6th, uh, born a month early, and they're still in the hospital. The baby is still in the NICU there. And, uh, and Casey's uh, still in the hospital as well. I think she had to uh, j just keep her, her health in your prayers and the baby's health. It looks like the baby's health is doing well, and Casey's is kind of back and forward right now. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, things are, uh, are fairly positive. I've traded texts with Jamie a couple times this morning, and we just want to keep uh, the, the family, uh, Jamie and Casey and, and Zoe, uh, in, in our prayers. And also, Tara Carter, uh, last evening, uh, tripped off a curb, fell off a curb in Broadhead, and broke her ankle in two places. And uh, so she's really laid up right now and, and in a lot of pain, uh, only taking Advil because the pharmacy at Walgreens doesn't open up until noon today. And so uh, she's, uh, she's getting by on Advil until then. So keep her uh, in your prayers. Keep the family in your prayers. And, of course, we're praying for Bill Souder and Bonnie Neely. And uh, I heard from the Brummett family this morning, uh, Michael texted me, and that family has been really hit hard with sickness and asked if we would pray uh, uh, for them. Nothing major, he said, but they just keep getting knocked down with viruses and, and other things. And so let's keep the Brummets uh, in, in our prayers uh, this morning. Well, before our choir scenes, let's pray again right now for these requests and for the service. It's good to have the Bryants back with us, feeling well enough to be here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Brother Michael Bryant, would you lead us in prayer, brother? Father, we rejoice in that you're able to be here today. We thank you for bringing us together for a time of fellowship and worship and how wonderful our counselor and mighty God is. What a special time of the year this is that we can 
celebrate the birth, but we know, Father, in doing that, that we're celebrating the entire life of Jesus. And we thank you that he has come as our Savior and that we are to make him Lord of our lives. We thank you, Father, for this church, the folks who compose this body, and we pray for every person, every family. And Father, we pray especially for these who have been mentioned. So many needs within our church body, so many needs within our community. And Lord, we just pray for healing, we pray for your touch, we pray for encouragement and strength in the lives of those who have been mentioned. Father, as we continue to worship you and praise you, we pray that you bless our choir and you always blesses us. We pray your blessings upon our pastor. We thank you for your leadership and your anointing in his life. And we pray that we will have ears and hearts to listen today as you speak through him to us. Thank you, Father, for loving us and for all you are and all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
let's sing. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother. So tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Everyone stay. We'll sing, O oh, Little Town of Bethlehem, number 250. of wandering love all morning stars together Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you just thanking you once again for another day, for another Sunday, for another time that we can just lift up our praise to you. Lord, and as it draws closer, uh, the celebration of your birth, Father, we lift up these carols, and we just want you to know that we remember that you were born only to die for us, Lord, the greatest sacrifice, but the greatest price for our sin, Lord. We love you. We just pray that you will be with us here and bless us as we continue to worship you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Star and angels 
gave the sign Bow to babe on bended knee The Savior of humanity Unto us a child is born He shall reign forevermore is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father and the prince of peace for a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we thank you for what we have heard uh, this morning, uh, from the congregational singing to the choir to the special that was just uh, presented. Uh, we thank you for the truth of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And as Sean reminded us, born to die, uh, to pay the penalty that all of us owed but none of us could redeem. And we thank you, Father, for that marvelous truth. May we always be humbled by it, and at the same time edified by it. Only the gospel can both humble and lift up. And Father, may we, uh, may, may joy resound in our hearts, not just at this time of year, but always at the truth uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so may that be the banner that we wave, may that be the definition of Christianity that we present, 
uh, to a lost world, uh, to friends and family, to co-workers. Uh, and Father, may, may the joy that doesn't just come from packages and presents and, and lights, which is all very special, but the joy that comes from being born again and eternally secured, regardless of what may be going on in our bodies or our minds or our lives or our worlds. Now, may that joy, Father, be present at all times so that we may see others come to know Christ and brought in to his fold. Now, Father, as we open up your word, looking to the Old Testament to a man uh, who, who should have learned from lessons in life, from lessons from your word, but didn't, uh, Father, may we um, learn from those mistakes and make the appropriate changes uh, so that we can live lives that are a blessing to us now and also glorify your name. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, let me ask you a question. As you find 1 Samuel 28 uh, in your Bibles, let me ask you a question. And the question is this. What do you think is better, a good start or a good finish? You don't have to answer out loud, but just answer to yourself. What's better, a good start or a good finish? In 2016, my, uh, my Texas A&M Aggies were in the NCAA tournament. They were seeded third. And in the second round, they were playing the 11th seeded uh, Northern Iowa Panthers. And the Aggies were getting destroyed. In fact, there was only 44 seconds left of that game. 44 seconds were left, and they were down a dozen. And the Aggies put a full-court press on Northern Iowa, and I won't give you a play-by-play -play from there on, but they went on a 14-2 run and ended up winning 92-88 in overtime. The, the poor Northern Iowa Panthers, an 11th seed against a 3 seed, started off great and were fantastic for the entire game just not the last 44 seconds. And that ended up costing them the game and getting them kicked out of the tournament. They, they started well, but they didn't finish well. Now, on the flip side of that, A&M started off awful, but those fighting farmers of Texas finished really well and advanced on to the Sweet 16. Now, if you think, now, that's a team sport. Let's think about an individual sport. Way back in 19, I think it was 1996, Greg Norman was six strokes ahead on the final round of the Masters, one of the premier golfing tournaments. Everybody wants that coveted green jacket that a winner of the Masters receives. He was six strokes ahead going into the final day on Sunday. Everybody thought it was going to be a victory lap for the Shark as he would finish out the tournament and, and, and win his green jacket. But he fell apart. I mean, he was brilliant on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But on Sunday, he fell apart. And he ended up losing by five strokes to a fellow who ended up winning named Nick Faldo. And not only did the green jacket elude Greg Norman that year, he never won one his entire career. I'm telling you, beloved, it's better to finish well than to start well. Amen? And that's why the, the, one of the presidents of Moody Bible Institute named William Culbertson he used to pray this, Lord, help us to end well. And I say amen to that because a prayer for my own life, and you could pray this for me as well, I want to press the tape. You know what that means? They don't have a tape anymore when you run races. They have uh, digital lines that get uh, shot across from one end of the uh, track to the other. But they used to pull a tape literally across the finish line, and the one who ran across that finish line would breast the tape. And I want to breast the tape. I want to run all the way to the end. I don't want to just get out of the blocks well. I don't want to have a good first leg, second leg, third leg. I want to end well, not on a heap on the side of the track or any other way. And what I've learned in my life and what I've learned from uh, reading God's Word is that good beginnings Good beginnings are no guarantee of successful endings. And Saul is proof of that. If there was ever a man who had a good beginning and a great opportunity to do God's will and to glorify God and to be a blessing to his people, it was King Saul. And yet, where we are this morning as we study through the life of Saul, we've been doing it on Sunday nights, we're going to end up on Sunday mornings, 
this guy is consulting a witch to understand what he ought to do. And he's going to end up committing suicide on the battlefield. I've got, your, I've got you in your Bibles at 1 Samuel 28. And in 1 Samuel 28, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but we see here a promised decisive battle between Israel and the Philistines. But up to this point, the conflict had been kind of skirmishes between the two nations uh, as of late. But now the Philistines, kind of perhaps sensing the weakness of Saul, the instability of Saul, they want to put a nail in his coffin and they want to defeat the nation of Israel and they're determined to defeat Israel. And so we read in 1 Samuel 28 verse 3 that Samuel was dead and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah even in his own city and Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. That's a little foreshadowing of what's to come. I, I am going to say kind of parenthetically the first two verses of 1 Samuel 28, I didn't read them, they're about David. This study is about Saul. David was on the run from Saul because Saul thought David was his enemy when he wasn't. And, and David is, has, at this point of his life, is receiving protection from a Philistine lord named Achish. And Achish is wanting David to go with him to battle against the Israelites. That's a story, that's a sermon for another time. But I just want you to understand that's what's going on in the background. And then we're, we're told that Samuel's dead, that Saul back in his early days, had put away these occultic uh, practitioners. He had gotten rid of them in, um, out of the land. And verse 4 then continues, And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, now look at these next five words. The Lord answered him not, and neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. And Saul said to his servant, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit. He's talking about a, a psychic, uh, a witch, whatever you want, uh, a, a medium, somebody who practices in the occult, however you want to uh, term that. Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there's a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men whipped him, and they came to the woman by night, and they said, I pray, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, you know what Saul has done. She doesn't know it's Saul, he's disguised. You know what Saul has done, how he's cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swear to her by the Lord, as the Lord lives, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. The scriptures tell us that Saul disguised himself to go visit this witch. And we also know from the scriptures that earlier in his reign, Saul had taken a stand against this kind of occultic nonsense, and he had put them out of the land. But now he is disguising himself to go inquire of one of these people what he ought to do. And in fact, it's interesting to think about it this way. He's not really disguising himself. He's actually revealing himself. Oh, yeah, he's got a disguise on, so physically he can't be recognized. This woman didn't even know who he was. But he's actually revealing himself. He's revealing the... Uh, the decay and the darkness of his spiritual condition. The king of Israel, anointed by God, who at one time and at one point prophesied uh, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, is now going to a witch to find out how he ought to move forward. God had turned his back on Saul. We talked about that two weeks ago, and God was not answering Saul. I just want to say, uh, that's what sin does to our lives. And God's not answering his people. When God doesn't, uh, when, when it seems as if God is distant from us, it's not because he's moved, it's because we've moved. And if you want a New Testament reference for this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, where, where Peter says to husbands that we are to live with our wives in an understanding way. They are the weaker, they are the weaker vessel. They are our, our wives, and we are to, they are also fellow heirs of grace. And we are to dwell with him uh, in understanding so that, here's what he says, our prayers may not be hindered. And when we, and when we are 
uh, following after sinful behavior, whether it's in our relationships with our wives or anybody else or anything else in our life, when we will not confess and repent and forsake our sin, I mean, that's going to hinder our access to God. Not because, not because he's moved away, but because we've moved away. Not because he is somehow overcome by our sin, but because we need to get that right with him and with others, if the case need be, before he will hear us. And so in an act of desperate fear, and we know that from verse 5, he, Saul is desperately afraid. He was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. In desperate fear of the Philistines and the threat that they presented, he goes to a witch, and he wants this witch to channel for him the spirit of Samuel. I didn't read it, but you can see it there in verse 11. Then said the woman, who shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. Now, ordinarily, this witch would have used a demon, most likely, and that demon would have impersonated Samuel. But this time, God permitted Samuel to appear. That's what we see in the following verses. And when the woman, verse 12, saw Samuel, she cried with a, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, what have, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. It, it, the, the fact that when she realized that this was genuine and not false, when she realized that this was divine and not demonic, it, it caused her to fear. It caused her to fear of what was being done, and it caused her to fear because she knew now that it was Saul who had disguised himself that was appearing before her. And she not only was afraid of what was happening, but she was afraid of what might happen. She realized that God was at work. And if you jump forward with me to verse 15, Saul expresses his distress to Samuel. And, 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 and let me just say here, th this doesn't mean that mediums or psychics have the kind of power to do this. Th th God permitted this woman to bring up the spirit of Samuel to speak to Saul. This is the macabre. This is a disturbing uh, sequence of events in the life of God's people, in the life of this king of Israel. And God, who is sovereign over all things, allowed this. She did not have this power. She did not have this ability. God permitted this to happen, and it scared her to death. And what Saul was about to hear, he found no comfort in it either. And so beginning in verse 15, we read this. And Samuel said to Saul, why have you disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and answers me no more, not by prophets nor by dreams, because that's in, in, this, in this economy of God's interaction with his people, you know, the, the, the word of God was nowhere near completed. The Old Testament was nowhere near completed. And so God spoke to his people just as he does now to his people through his word, but also then through prophets and through dreams, as we read earlier, earlier through, through the, uh, uh, the Ur Urim and Thurim. And he says, neither uh, God answers me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I've called thee, that you may make known unto me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Wherefore do you ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord has rent, the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, even to David, because you obeyed not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore has the Lord done this thing unto you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also... It gets even worse for Saul here. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee. The nation and you are going to be delivered into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me, dead. The Lord also uh, uh, into the hand of, uh, uh, shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth. He, just, he, he basically he just passes out. And he was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day, nor all the night. So Saul expresses his distress because of what's going on, because of the Philistine threat, because of God's silence. And Samuel reminded him of his previous warnings. This is what Scripture always does. This is what any preacher and pastor will do, is often remind us of what we already know. 
And, and uh, Samuel had already told Saul that this would happen if he would continue in his disobedience, if he would not confess and forsake his sin, if he would not honor God. This is exactly what would happen, and that's what happened. And Samuel tells him, even in this, even in this eerie, unusual, unrepeated, I would also say, circumstance of being drawn up and speaking from the dead in an actual spirit form, he says to him, it's just as you already knew. Israel's going to be defeated. You and your sons are going to be killed, and David is going to be king. And I want us to consider as we uh, uh, get really close to finishing up this study on the life of Saul, I want us to consider the contrast uh, of this man. The contrasts from beginning to this point are as stark as night and day. And the first contrast is courage and, uh, between courage and fear. At the beginning of his reign, Saul was a great man of courage. If you remember that instance when he was anointed king, it's not that he sought out the kingship. It's not that he was playing games for that. It's not that he was politicking to be made king of Israel. He wanted nothing to do with it. But, but God anointed him to be king of Israel, and he took to it. And there were many people. There was, a, there was at least one king. I shouldn't say many, but there was at least a contingent that said, who is this guy? How is he going to rule over us? And when a threat was presented to the nation of Israel, specifically to Jabesh Gilead, Saul took action. And he, he, he um, defeated the Ammonites, and he showed great courage in the face of not only the naysayers, but of the enemies. If you remember that whole episode, he took an ox, and he cut the ox in pieces, and he sent the ox. He cut the ox into 12 pieces, and he sent it to the 12 tribes, and he said, everybody follow me. Meet me at this point. We're going to take action against the Ammonites. And that's exactly what happened. And so with great courage, he went and faced the enemy and defeated the enemy. But how different he is now at the end of his reign. At this point in his life, he's trembling and afraid. He's trembling and afraid as he looks out and sees the host of the Philistines. Here's part of the problem. Instead of looking to the Lord, instead of looking to the word of God, instead of looking to what Samuel had shared with him and what he knew God's word was to him, instead of looking to the Lord, his eyes are on the obstacles. All he can see are the people who oppose him. All he can see is the army that's aligned against, against him across the valley. All he can see are the people who are whispering about him in the background, and they don't want to follow him. And uh, some of them, no doubt, saying, this is what we said in the beginning. We shouldn't have been following this guy from the start. And maybe even that crowd had grown, and that's all he could see. He could not see his Lord. He could not see his Lord's word, he could only see the obstacles and the opponents. I, I want to take the time, I think it'd be worthwhile, hold your place in 1 Samuel 28 um, and look to chapter 12, I think it is. Chapter, it, it, this won't take long, but let's just trace this out because it's interesting to note the growing fear in Saul's life. So in 1 Samuel 12, after Jabesh Gilead has been rescued by Saul and after Samuel has this really this public anointing of, uh, Samuel leads this public anointing of Saul. He had a private one before, and now he's kind of commissioning him. And it's 1 Samuel 12, verse 24. Here is what Saul is saying, not only to the king, but to the people. Only fear who? Only fear the Lord and serve him and serve him in truth with what? All your heart. For consider how great things he hath done. Only fear the Lord. Don't fear others. Don't fear your situation. Don't fear your circumstances. Don't fear politics. Don't fear the doctor's diagnosis. Don't fear death. And that's easy for me to say. I get it. It's easy for us to hear, but this is what it means to have faith. If faith means anything, it mean, it's got to mean something when stuff is hard. When it doesn't go the way I want it to go, when I don't hear what I want to hear, when, uh, when things are not as I thought they would be, only fear the Lord. Only fear the Lord when you've just defeated Jabesh Gilead and everybody's singing your praises and the people who were naysaying you, now everybody's turned on them. And uh, you're having a coronation service, fear the Lord then and fear the Lord when everything seems against you. And serve him in truth with your whole heart, for consider the great things he hath done. That's 1 Samuel 12. Now look at 1 Samuel 
15. Let's just rehearse this a little bit. It's good for us to be reminded of what we already know. 1 Samuel 15, um, in verse 24. This is, after the, this is after his great sin of offense with the Amalekites, where he was supposed to, and we've talked about this already, verses 22 and 23 are some of the most famous verses in all the scriptures, let alone 1 Samuel. But verse 24 is what I want you to notice. He, he, didn't, he didn't obey God completely, only partially. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. And this, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. This is where um, uh, it was confirmed that God is going to take away the kingdom from him. And Saul said to Samuel, chapter 15, verse 24, And Saul said to Samuel, uh, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy word. That sounds good, but it's just, it's just wind addressing. Here's why because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And when you go on with this, we've talked about this already. I'm not going to rehash it all, all the way through. But he was more, he, he's confessing his sin, not because he recognizes that his offense was against Christ, against the Lord, but because he feared the people. I feared the people, and I obeyed their voice. So he goes from fearing the Lord only to fearing the people. And then look with me in chapter 18. This is where he begins to see an enemy where there is no enemy, and he begins to fear where he shouldn't, where he should trust. 1 Samuel 18, let's just cherry pick some verses. Verse 12, and Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and had departed from Saul. Look down to verse 15. Wherefore, when Saul that David behaved himself wisely, he was afraid of him. Look down to verse 29. And Saul yet was more afraid of David. And Saul became David's enemy continually. And then if you look back in the text, we've caught ourselves back up in, verse 20, in chapter 28, verse 5. We're just reminded that Saul, that Saul saw the host of the Philistines, and he was afraid, and he greatly trembled. What we need to learn from this, beloved, is that courage is connected to a clear conscience. If you lack courage, most often it's because you have a guilty conscience. But you, you, won't, you won't have a guilty conscience and courage. Now, you can have a guilty conscience and false courage. Uh, sometimes false courage is aided by alcohol or barbiturates or whatever else. But you can't have a, guilt, you can't have a guilty conscience and, and courage. Courage comes from a pure heart. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursues. <laughs> the, the, the wicked think there's always people out to get them. They're always running from something. Uh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, it, it's actually a couple places in Proverbs. You can look this up later. You know, but it, it, it's the lazy man, it's, which is a contrast with the wicked man. But the lazy man is constantly saying there's a lion in the streets. There's a lion in the streets, which means I can't get out today. I can't get out and go to work today. I can't get out and do things today because there's a lion out there in the street. You can't do anything when there's a lion out there. And in a similar way, the wicked man is fleeing when no man pursues. But the righteous, Proverbs 28, 1 says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. And so we have this contrast between courage and fear. And then here's the other contrast between godly wisdom and human foolishness. In the beginning of his reign, Saul used wisdom. But in the end of his reign, he's characterized by foolishness. At the beginning, he was listening to the wisdom of God. And that wisdom came primarily through the word of God that had been revealed so far and through Samuel's counsel. But in time, he ignored both the counsel of God's word and the counsel of godly Samuel. He stopped seeking the wisdom of the Lord, and he, and he gradually became a fool. And in time, God regarded Saul with silence. Not because God is, uh, is, uh, deals with us arbitrarily, and he is pernicious, and every now and again he'll just listen to you, and then he'll just decide because he gets a wild hair one day to not listen to you. God is not like we are. God is not like that. If God regards you with silence, it's because of one of two things. One, in this case, it's because you've disregarded him, and you're not listening to him. You're not seeking his counsel. Or number two, you can read 2 Corinthians uh, chapter. Uh, 10 or 11, I forget off the top of my head, where God regarded Paul with silence because Paul was wanting something removed from him, and three times Paul asked for God to remove this from him, and God won't do it. And finally, uh, the silence is broken because God says, hey, listen, that thorn in the flesh is from me. 
My grace is sufficient for you. And your, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So quit asking for that and press on. <laughs> and there's a difference between godly wisdom and human foolishness. And I want you to think about this with me. When you think about God no longer regarding Saul and regarding Saul with silence. And I mentioned that from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 as well. Think about this with me. Why should God reveal areas unknown to us when we are disregarding and disobeying what we already know? I mean, so often we act like God has shut, off, shut us off. God won't answer me. God won't reveal this to me about, I don't know, about an issue you have that needs resolved, about a, a something with which you're struggling. But that which you know, which is clear, which is to, uh, uh, to be patient, to, uh, to trust his word, to, uh, to be committed to the gospel, to share the truth with others, to be a person of prayer, to be a person in the word, to be a person uh, uh, of, of clean character, all these things, all these things that we know uh, that are plainly revealed in Scripture, when we don't obey that, why should we expect God to reveal something else to us through his word or any other way? It, it, it actually lets us off the hook. It may... It, it, it's an attempt for us to make God somehow the bad guy because he won't lead me in this area. He's silent to me all of a sudden when we're not obeying what we know to do. That's why I often tell myself, I tell my family, and I tell this church, when you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. I don't know what to do in this area. I don't know how to handle this situation. I don't know how to keep, I, I keep banging my head in the wall with this person or this situation or this circumstances. What do I do? Do what you know to do and keep doing that and don't stop it. Just keep doing that. And God will reveal to you in his time what he wants you to do. The ultimate expression of Saul's foolishness came when he consulted a witch. A witch. And don't let yourself off the hook with this. Here's what I mean by that. Don't say, well, dude, I've never done this. I've never gone to a psychic. I've never even dialed Cleo's hotline. I've never even used tarot cards. I've never even used the Parker Brothers Ouija board. I've been with people, and they've gotten that out. They said, look, it's Parker Brothers. It's the same thing as Monopoly board. How could it be bad? But they've gotten the Ouija board out, and, and I've gone away. And so, man, I, I can't relate to what you're saying here because I've not done what Saul has done. Don't let yourself off the hook just because you haven't consulted a psychic. If you listen to the world, it does, if you listen to the world instead of the word, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It might not be as awful. It might not look as bad. It might not sound as bad. But if you follow worldly wisdom instead of biblical wisdom, it's the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting from the hip right here. And so I got to look it up because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 20 and 25. At the end of verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 1, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Because the foolishness, verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The very thing that we celebrate right now at this time of year, the incarnation of Christ, God becoming flesh, uh, a, a virgin, the Holy Spirit moving upon a virgin so that she conceived and bare Jesus Christ, the Holy One, that very truth is foolishness to this world, right? Because we all know how it works. We know how, it, we, know how we get a baby. And so... Not just now, but ever since that time in Bethlehem, there have been people who say, the very thing you're talking about, Christian, the very thing you're talking about, church, the very thing you're talking about, preacher, that is foolishness. It's pie in the sky. It's nonsense. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way except for this once. When the Holy Spirit moved upon the Virgin Mary, who had not known a man and did not know a man, until after Christ was born, when she did give birth with Joseph to many sons and uh, at least a daughter. Scripture lets us know. But Jesus Christ was all of God and all of man, 
He was all of God because he's always been God and always will be God. And he is all of man because he was born of a woman one night in Bethlehem. Emmanuel, God with us. And it's foolishness. And the foolishness gets even deeper because then we say that that man lived a perfect life. And then we say that man, because of his death on the cross, his death on the cross paid the penalty for our sins. That seems like foolishness. And then we say it gets even fool more foolish because we say three days after he was buried, he was resurrected. He came up from the grave. His body wasn't stolen. He didn't just revive in the tomb because uh, uh, he, he, he was almost dead. Or as the princess bride says, he was mostly dead. But then we did some kind of incantations and now he's mostly alive. No, he was all dead. He was buried. And three days later, he rose again from the grave. It's foolishness to man, but it's the wisdom of God to those who are being saved. And when you listen to the world instead of to God's word, I didn't say to individuals, I said to God's word, then it's just as foolish as seeking a witch at Endor to find out what you ought to do next. Don't let yourself off the hook because you don't call up Cleo. The next thing we see in between the contrast between Saul at the start and Saul at the end was standing versus falling. I mean, Saul had a statue that was heads and shoulders above the rest. Literally, he was greatly admired of the people. But in verse 20 of chapter 28, you read that with me. Saul fell straightway all along the earth. He fell physically, and it, that was just emblematic of his spiritual fall. If you look forward to chapter 31, in verse 4, he fell on his sword. Then, then said Saul to his armor bearer, draw your sword, thrust me through. The armor bearer wouldn't do it. And so verse 5 says that Saul dared himself. Or, or verse 4 at the end says that he, he took his sword and fell upon it and he died. And his son's with him. We not be, we, beloved, we're not able to fall from our salvation, but we can fall from our steadfastness. And when we refuse to humble ourselves, that will result in humiliation. Humbling yourself before God and others is not the same thing as being humiliated. There's a difference between humility and humiliation. And 1 Corinthians 10 says, let him that thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. And then we're reminded in 1 Peter that, beloved, seeing that you know these things, seeing that you know these things, beware lest you be led away in error and fall from your steadfastness. Not fall from your salvation, but fall from your steadfastness. Well, let's go ahead and land the plane. This is the final contrast between Saul's start and his end, and that's between victory and defeat. At the start, Saul was victorious. He was victorious over the Ammonites, and he was victorious over his own spirit. Because if you remember, after that great big win with, uh, at Jabesh Gilead, people were saying, hey, let's kill these naysayers, these people that said, Saul, who's he? he? He can't reign over us. Let's put them to death too. And Saul said, we ain't doing that. He was able to control his temper, and he did not retaliate. But at the end of his life, all we see is tragedy. He's trying to kill David, who is not his enemy. He can't stand against the Philistines, who are his enemy, and he ends up taking his own life. There, there's probably not a more pathetic battle depiction in all the Old Testament than the battle of Gilboa. Maybe, maybe there are, but it, it sure seems like it's the most pathetic to me. And in that battle, Saul fell on his own sword and took his own life rather than dying at the hands of the Philistines. Beloved, a good beginning is no guarantee of a successful ending. It's possible to start in courage and end in fear. It's possible to, to begin with God's wisdom and end in human foolishness. It's possible to start by standing and end by falling, to begin in victory and end in defeat. And what we have here this morning is an opportunity. This is, this is how we're going to end. We have an opportunity for confession and repentance, for admitting the sin, but not just admitting the sin, Paul would, uh, I mean, Saul would do that, but forsaking that sin, turning from it. He wouldn't do that. 
That's what, that's what made the difference between him and David. David did both. He confessed his sin and he forsook it. We have an opportunity for confession and repentance, for restoration and reconciliation. And that opportunity, here's what you need to recognize, and this isn't hyperbole, this isn't for effect, that opportunity may be gone tomorrow. So we need to take advantage of that opportunity today to confess and repent. And maybe it needs to be confession and repentance unto salvation, but most likely that's not the case. Maybe you need to just get your heart right with God. And as David said, David didn't need to be saved, but he needed to be restored. And unlike Saul, David said, Psalm 51, after his adultery with Bathsheba, after his murder of Uriah, after all of that, he said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a what? A right spirit within me. I love Keith Green's music. You might not know, he died in the 70s in a plane crash, uh, but so much, there's one album of his that I especially like, and he, he, he sings this. I, I can't read Psalm 5110, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me without hearing that melody and that tune in, in my head. Look it up on YouTube or wherever else. You could, it, it'll be worth your search. But this is a song we all need to sing. And like I said, maybe you need to sing it for the first time to be saved. Or maybe, like me, like David, you need to ask God to have mercy on you and to create in you a clean heart to be restored. To be restored. To have reconciliation. To flip it from defeat to victory. May the Lord help us to end well. A good start is not a guarantee of a good finish. And Father in heaven, as we prepare ourselves to conclude this sermon, we understand that the end of the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts and our minds is nowhere near complete. And it also doesn't hinge upon the singing of the music. Your spirit works on us in its own timing. And so, Father, I pray that we learn. From, uh, there, there is so much about Saul to be admired, but so much that's just tragic. Tragic because of his refusal to honor your word. And to, there's only one way to honor your word, and it's not with lip service, but it's with commitment to it. And, Father, I, I can see how easily not just for myself, but for all of us to follow in Saul's line and stumble and fall on, during the race and at the end because we've taken our eyes off you, the author and finisher of our faith, and we're looking at our obstacles, whether they be situ people or situations or circumstances, and we fear others, and we fear situations, and we fear things rather than fearing you alone. So, Father, help us to remember what we know, and that's to fear you only, to serve you completely with a whole heart, and to joyfully trust you no matter the cost or consequences. Father, help us all as individuals and as a church to breast the tape. And we don't know where the finish line is for us individually or for this church uh, or, or for this world for that matter. Only you know where that line is. Ours is not to look for the line. Ours is not to uh, try to be strategic in that kind of way. We'll, we'll start to run when we can tell we're towards the end. May we just run well. And, some, and that doesn't mean to be always in a sprint. Help us to be plodding along faithfully it's not about the speed. It's about the direction and the commitment to plod on ahead all the way to the end. Father, I don't care if I run across the line hard. I just want to breast the tape. 
And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Will we go on St. John? Whiter than snow. If you need to come, you come. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want you forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. I want to read a couple of things to you. I got a couple of thank you cards uh, that I want to share with you. This, first of all, I want to thank uh, Joyce Cummins for all the work that she did in putting together that foster Christmas party that was such a success on, uh, on Friday night. Can uh, we give her a round of applause for that, uh, Miss Joyce Cummins? And then I wanted, she, uh, she gave this card to Diana to share. This is from uh, the, uh, the Pointer family. Uh, and they just wanted to wish uh, our, our church a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, they are, they're so thankful for, for that effort and, and that work. And I wanted, to, I wanted to share that with you. I'll, I'll hang that up in the shadow box out there. And also, I got this from uh, the, uh, the Kelly family. And, of course, Miss Virgie Kelly uh, was called home to be with the Lord uh, a week and a half or so ago. And uh, Tim and Brenda Wright, church family. Thank you for your thoughts and prayers during the passing of Tim's mother, Virgie. A special thank you to each that reached out personally, whether it was a card or a phone call or at the funeral home. Uh, we love you all from the bottom of our hearts, Tim and Brenda, Kelly, and family. And I wanted to share that with you, and I'll put that out there for you as well on the, uh, on the shadow box. Don't forget about this evening at 6 o'clock. Choir, you need to be here at 4.30, Miss Debbie says. Uh, she, uh, she reminded me of that. It's in the bulletin. Uh, 4.30 tonight, choir at 6 o'clock church. We'll be here for the Christmas carol service. That will be a special time together tonight. Next Sunday in the morning, our kids will have a presentation. Uh, that will be special. And then his heart quartet will have a presentation in the evening of the 18th. And then on December 25th, don't forget that we're only going to have one service. No Sunday school, no evening service, just the 11 o'clock worship service on Christmas Day. And also, Shine will not have services next Sunday or Christmas Day. So I uh, want you to make you aware of that. Don't forget to pray for those prayer requests that we mentioned. Uh, the Brummets, uh, Brother Bill Souter, uh, Miss Bonnie Neely, and especially uh, the Todd family. Uh, uh, Jamie needs our prayers, but particularly pray for Casey and, and little Zoe. And also, uh, Joe and Judy Fain are in Houston, Texas. She, you know, she has to go periodically to get checked up because of the cancer, and uh, they're, I think they're in Houston um, right now for that, so keep them uh, in your prayers. I'm going to ask Noah Fain, would you dismiss us in prayer? Noah was here last. It's good to have all our college students back. I missed Grant last week. Is Grant here? No, but Will is. It's good to see you, Will. It's good to see all our other college students. Grant was here, and I missed him. Noah was here on Wednesday, and then on Thursday I saw him at the gym, but I didn't have my glasses on. That's a long story why I don't wear my glasses at the gym, but I confused him with his brother. I said, hey, Ethan, it's good to see you. When'd you get in? And Noah said, I was here last night. You saw me at church, man. <laughs> and uh, so, I, but uh, it's good to have them back from uh, college. And uh, Noah, why don't you close us in prayer, brother? Uh, thank you, God, for this day and allowing us to gather here and worship. Um, I pray for all the prayer requests and my mom being in Texas and all the other.